Tonight's verse will be from Revelation 6, verses 9 through 11. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. They cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will, ju- before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on this earth? Then they, will each give, then they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete who were to be killed as they themselves had been. All right, so picking up there in chapter 6 of the book of Revelation is where we're going to start because that's where we left off last week uh, whenever we were studying this. We're in the second section of the outline or division of the book that I like to use, seven different uh, sections, that first section being the seven candlesticks, and now we're in the seven seals. And of course, as we just read that we finished up last week, we are in that, that sixth seal. But as way of reminder, if we go back and we look at what we have studied so far, so that just kind of reminds you of where we're at in this, this chapter is there is this scroll we had in chapters 4 and 5, this scene of heaven. And part of that scene, that vision that John had was in the right hand of the one sitting on the throne was a scroll, and it had seven seals on it. And there was no one who could take that scroll or was worthy to take that scroll and to open those seals. And then we see the Lamb, that being the line of the tribe of Judah, Jesus comes and takes that scroll and begins to open those seals. The first seals, first four seals being those four horsemen, and we talked about what their significance is and their meaning. And then we get to uh, seal number five, and there we have uh, this martyrdom. He's opening up this fifth seal. And so as was just read, this is now a picture of, that will relate to the Christians that would be reading this letter in the first century. Remember, this is written down to be sent out to all the churches. And so Christians were experiencing persecution, and this is God's way of saying, I hear you, I see you, and I hear you. So whenever he says that he saw the souls slain under the altar. This immediately is going to bring up imagery in the mind of the the Israelites, of the Christians who were Jewish, who remember that temple, the temple where there was an altar and you would bring your sacrifices to that altar and the Levites would then take those and they would give the sacrifices to God in exchange for any substitution, I should say, of your sins. So this is helping people who at the time were experiencing severe persecution. Persecution where uh, you've seen and heard of pictures where that Christians were taken to the various Colosseums. There's more than one Colosseum in the Roman Empire, but especially there in Rome. And for entertainment, were thrown out there, and then lions and wild animals were released uh, to do what they're going to do to human beings. And so for entertainment, people were sitting in the stands like we would if we're going to a football game or something and watching human beings being ripped apart by a lion. Sounds lovely, doesn't it? Well, that's exactly what Christians were experiencing. And so in this, verse 9 The word testimony or witness, depending on which version of the Bible that you have, your translation, is a word in the Greek, martyria. It's where we get our word martyr, talking about those who were killed in the name of Jesus. Those who died in their Christianity, like those who were sacrificed, that were burned at the stake, who were sacrificed to animals or who were killed in various ways, throughout persecution because Christianity was not accepted in the Roman Empire at this time. It took them a little while to figure out that there's a difference between Jews 
and Christians. At first, they thought Christians and Jews were the same thing, but then there began to be some serious persecution against them because these weird people called Christians would talk about uh, their brothers and sisters, and I remember, if I'm being a Roman, one of them talked about his wife is also his sister in Christ, whatever that means. And then they, in their worship services, they drink the blood and eat the body of the one that they followed. I mean, cannibalism and, and, and incest. I mean, what kind of religion we got? We got to put this down. You, you understand where I'm coming from? And when you think about the language that we use, it could be confusing to pagan people. And so it, it just added to the problem which drove the Christians underground, as some of you might know from the catacombs and things like that. The point of this seal is to let the Christians know who received this that God hears and sees their pain. And what he's about to show them through the rest of the book, answers because the rest of the book really focuses on this answer, on this, this question that they have. And their question is, how long? How long are you going to let our blood uh, go unavenged? We want you to get to revenge uh, on, for us. We want you to go out and, and make it right, judgment, pass judgment on those who wrongfully killed us. And God is saying in this vision, be patient. Everything is in God's timing. And so that's where we are in chapter 6. So now we get to the sixth seal. So we have this scroll that is written on the inside and the outside. We see that vision of those four horsemen, which is the gospel going out, and then persecution following the gospel, which brings death, which can also bring war and calamity. And that's what led to these martyrs that are now below the altar. This is all symbolism and a vision. It's not literal, although there are literally martyrs, but the vision is just this imagery. So now... We're having this sixth seal, and we have some more imagery, some a poetic way of describing a very terrible scene. You see that picture there, looking at that picture. Let's read now what it says about the sixth seal. Verse 12, I looked, and when he opened the sixth seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became like blood, and the stars of heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree drops its late figs when it is shaken by a mighty wind. Then the sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. Wow, that's a pretty serious scene. Um, he's using these poetic ways of saying, for example, the sky receded like a scroll being rolled up and then put away. This is a picture of the end of Time, the end of the world, the end of when judgment, that last day, whenever judgment's going to be rendered, God is saying to those martyrs, when am I going to do it? It'll happen on the day of judgment. And it's going to be this mighty scene. And notice that there are seven things that are listed there. You have the great earthquake. You have the sun becoming black. You have the moon becoming like blood. You have the stars falling to the earth. You have the sky receding as a scroll. You have the mountains and the islands moved out of their place, seven. Now, numerology plays a big part in the book of Revelation. We're going to see that in just a few moments when we get into chapter seven. The number seven means perfection or complete. It is complete and total destruction. In other words, the earth is going to go away. The universe that we know it is going to go away. And look at the result, the next few verses, verse 15. And the kings, notice how many we have here, the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, and every slave and every free man. Hmm, seven, once again. See the poetic way that's in there? Again, this numerology, complete. In other words, there's not a human being. It doesn't matter who you are how important you may think you are, what position you are in society, or anything else, whatever moniker you want to put on yourself, whatever category you want to put yourself in, it says 
They hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day, circle that word, the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? So what we have in this seven seals is a picture of time. We have from the beginning, the creation, and then up to, we have there in that first horse, the gospel going out. And really the gospel is a continuation of what God's been saying all along. He wants that relationship with you. But now he sends his son out, you have the gospel going out, persecution follows that, and then you wind up having people die in the name of Jesus and God is saying, there will be judgment and nobody will escape it. It'll be so bad that they'll be crying out for rocks to fall on them so that they don't have to fall into the hands of the living God. What did David say? It's a frightful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. But notice, there's another phrase that he uses that we never use very often. He says, and the wrath of the lamb. I don't know how much y'all been around lambs, but I've never been around a wrathful lamb. Have you? Have you ever seen a wrathful lamb? Well, it shows you a little bit about the nature of the Godhead. You have God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit. God, uh, Jesus is described as a lamb, being that sacrifice, but also a lamb is innocent and is pure and unblemished. And we think about a lamb as something that is not something that is going to, not like a lion, even though Jesus described as a lion, but it says that he has wrath. Well, for the people who are receiving judgment, how are they going to look at whoever it is that is rendering judgment? They're going to look at it being wrathful towards them. And so they're experiencing that. This is that end of the world. The last day. All right. So that's what you have here in the sixth seal. He's answering their question, not completely yet, but he's saying there will be judgment. There will come a day. And that's what he wants them to know. Even though there's going to be trouble and injustice and suffering, Christ, don't forget, Christ conquered death. So we, Christians, those who follow him, will be victorious. There will be be justice. You can count on it. This is one of the things about Revelation that I tell people all the time. It's not, while this is scary when you read some of this, it's actually a book about hope. And that hope is we know Christians are going to win in the end because God says so. He says there will be justice. And that helps give you the right attitude as to how you're going to treat your fellow man. And that's what he's trying to get them to understand as well. All right. So now, going back to our outline that we like to use, now you can see all of this filled in so that you can see what each one of those stands for. So the first chapter, chapter 4 of this section was that throne seen in heaven, and then you see that scroll being introduced there in heaven in chapter 5. And then chapter 6, you see all those scrolls being opened, and each one of those verses there listing out what it is. Yes, there's still the seventh seal. We've got to open that seventh seal. It hasn't been opened yet. But wait just a minute, all right? It's almost as if God is saying, okay, now it's time for intermission. All right, have you ever been to a movie where that happens, one of those really long movies? I think the last one I went to that was like that, I think was Titanic. Doesn't it have an intermission in it or something? You know how they'll do that sometimes? They'll stop the movie and have an intermission, go to the restroom, go get your popcorn or whatever. Well, that's what we have here. It's kind of like, all right, we're going to stop the vision for just a second, and we're going to have a different vision come on. It's partly to help answer the question that the martyrs are asking. It's an interlude. And so hold on to the seventh seal. We'll come back to, we'll, we'll resume this, this vision in just a moment with the seals, but hold on to that. Right now, we're going to go to something else. Here, a word from our sponsors, if you will. All right. And so we get into chapter 7. All right, so chapter 7, very fascinating. But keep that in mind so that you understand what's happening. This is not one of the seals. This is a parenthetical 
interlude. It's to help explain some of the things that the martyrs were just asking. And these, after these things, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth or the sea or any tree. Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to uh, harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees till we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. All right, so we have <coughs> all of a sudden, John is seeing this vision uh, there in heaven with that scroll and everything. And as I mentioned, it's, it's as if God's saying, all right, hold up. Put down a pen for a second. I want to show you something that has to do with those martyrs. And all of a sudden he sees this vision of these angels, the four corners of the earth. We still use that today. We know that the earth is round, so there's not actual literal corners, but what do we say? North, east, south, and west, right? So that's what it's talking about. It's the entirety of the earth. And these angels have the power to hold back the winds of the earth. They have the power to destroy the earth. If you have ever heard Joe Wilson's explanation of how Jesus could call legions of angels and how just one angel can destroy the earth and he could call thousands of angels to destroy the earth, that's a lot of destruction. So here you see that power. This is what Joe's talking about. There's power here where they can hold back the winds, and he's one of the angels who's carrying the seal of God is saying, hold up, hold up, don't destroy everything just yet until we get God's people sealed. This is so very important because this is one of the things that people overlook when they get to other parts of the book of Revelation. How many people, when you ask them about the book of Revelation, tell me about the book of Revelation, what's the first thing they're going to say? Oh, the mark of the beast, right? You get marked in your head and your hand, and that's one of their big things that they like, the mark of the beast. Well, that's just one picture. Uh, probably got a red spot on my head now, don't I? <laughs> that's one picture of being sealed. Here's the other side of it. But notice which one's presented first. We haven't talked about the mark of the beast. The first thing we see is being sealed by God. Keep your finger right here for just a minute and go with me to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 1. And Paul the apostle uses this same kind of terminology to help us understand a little bit about what's going on here in Revelation. Another thing that I teach all the time about the book of Revelation is if you want to truly understand the book of Revelation, you need to know the whole Bible. So yes, that means you need to read Genesis and all the books before you get to Revelation so that you can understand what's going on in Revelation. Because if you do that, then when you come to verses, like we have here in chapter 7, verse 3, 2 and 3, you'll go, oh, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13 says, In him you also trusted, that being Jesus, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. There it is. There is this terminology that is used kind of like these, this scroll that's being sealed, right? You have your own seal that God has put on you to say, this one belongs to me, right? We do that with, with brands, Right, Everything that is sold has a seal of some sort on it, has a brand name stamped onto it or pasted onto it or put on it in one way. Well, this seal is the seal of the living God. It's saying, this person belongs to God. So that's what he's saying. He's saying, hold up, don't go destroy everything until we get everybody sealed. All right? So going back to seal number six... Remember, it was that destruction. He said, I'm going to give you a scene. Everything's destroyed. It's going to be terrible. Hold on to that. Before that happens, we want to make sure, if I can speak the words of God, we want to make sure we get all of God's people sealed. So that's the context that we have. Look now what happens in verse 4 and forward. He has now 
in addition to that vision about those people being sealed. And I heard the number of those who were sealed. Okay, 144,000. All right, right away, there's something that's a false doctrine that a lot of people like to propagate and that there are going to be only 144,000 people that are going to go to heaven. <laughs> well, like so many false doctrines, what I typically say is keep reading. You keep stopping before you read the rest of it because the rest of it will tell you what's happening. Look what it says. For 144,000 of the tribe of the children of Israel. How many of you in here are children of Israel? Nobody, right? Because <laughs> we're Gentiles. There's very few of us that can trace our lineage back to a tribe of the children of Israel. So immediately, well, guess you're not in the 144,000 going to heaven. You see how kind of ridiculous that is? We're already looking at something that is that is figurative language. And so the figurative language continues. Here we have, I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel were sealed. Remember, this is a vision. All right, so he goes now, of the tribe of Judah, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Reuben, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Gad, 12,000 were sealed. Of Asher, of Naphtali, of Manasseh, of the tribe of Simeon, of the tribe of Levi, of the tribe of Issachar, of the tribe of Zebulun, the tribe of Joseph, and the tribe of Benjamin. Okay, what's going on here? Well, number one, remember this is a book of symbolism. And so what do we have here? We have the number 12. Have we already seen the number 12 in the book of Revelation? Think back, chapters 4 and 5, the 12, the 24 elders, a multiple of 12 there, so 12 of the apostles and 12 of the leaders of the tribes, that would be 24. So we've already seen 12. So 12 is a number you see over and over throughout Scripture. Uh, even to this day, how many months of the year do we have? You know, and, and all the different things at the number 12. It's a very symbolic number in the Bible. And here it simply represents a number of a large number. It is 12 times 12 times 1,000. 1,000 always means a, an unmeasurable number, just a large number, not specifically 1,000. It's just a large number. And so here's how we know that this is not literal because if this was to be the tribes of judah notice there's some people missing if you know anything about the tribes you'll notice that there's some people missing here who are those people well it's the tribe of dan and the tribe of ephraim <laughs> wait a minute they're part of the israelites what did they do that was so bad well there's some symbolism in there as well but notice also he adds in there the tribe of levi and the tribe of Joseph. As far as I know, reading all through the Old Testament, there's not a tribe of Joseph. Joseph's was broken into two tribes, right? In fact, one of them's listed here with Manasseh, right? And so this obviously represents something else. Well, if it represents something else, what does it represent? To the people who read it in that day and age, it represents spiritual Israel. That's what we are today. This is showing God has just called out these people of Israel. There's no tribe that is more important, by the way, that is not even put in birth order. It's, just, it's not to be taken literally. It's just simply the contrast between the people of God, the people that belong to God, and the people that belong to Satan that we're going to get into here in just a little while later in the, in the book. And what he's saying is, I know the number. God knows the number of his people. Does God know the number of hairs on your head? Jesus says he does. Well, then he certainly knows how many people are his. And you're going to see later on when we get to chapter 14, this number comes up again. And guess what number it is? 144,000. There's symbolism in that. The symbolism is that whatever God has sealed, whatever God has, has uh, in his number, he's not going to lose a single one. In other words, the same ones that have been faithful till death are the same ones that will receive the promise. He doesn't lose a single one. 
Now, it doesn't mean you can't fall from the faith. I'm talking about symbolism of if you are obedient to God, you can count on the promise. All right, so it's symbolism. In fact, this is symbolic. It's a reminiscent of looking back into Numbers chapter 2, whenever God told the Israelites, you're going to line up in this manner in the marching order to go as you move from one camp to the next. So that's really what this represents is preparation. He's preparing his people. This is where we are now. It's the order. But look now what we have in verse 9. Verse 9, very important to understand, is a different vision. It's not a continuation. And so he says, after these things I looked, and that's your key right there, that this is a separate vision, and behold, a great multitude which no one could number. Now, he just got through giving us a number, right? Now, no one can number of all nations and tribes and peoples and tongues standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands. This is symbolism that the gospel is for all. It doesn't matter where you're from, who you are, what era, anything else. The gospel's for everyone. And that imagery of white robes and palm branches symbolizes peace. And so here they are. Crying out, says verse 10, in a loud voice saying, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. See, that's hearkening back to what the martyrs were crying. How long are you going to let us sit here? And he's saying, Salvation belongs to the Lord. Verse 11, And all the angels around the throne and the elders and the four living creatures fell on their faces before the throne of God and worshipped God. Now that's, again... Something that's a repeat of what we saw earlier in chapter 5, whenever all those elders fell down and worshipped. That's a very important point because they said, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders answered, saying to me, Who are these arrayed in white robes and where do they come from? And I said to him, Sir, you know. So he said to me, these are the ones who come out of the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will dwell among them. They shall neither hunger any more nor thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them nor any heat for the Lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to the living fountains of waters." And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. You see, there's the answer. There's the answer that he's given to those martyrs. God, how long are you going to, how long before you avenge our blood? He says, I got it under control. There's going to come a day of judgment, and it's going to be terrible. It's, there's going to be people, the ones that you're wanting judgment on, they're going to know it. They're going to want to hide their face from me. But while we're talking about that, let me show you something else. I have a number, and it's a set number of people now who are coming to me, my spiritual Israel who's coming to me now. And then he shows him this other vision. He says, and it's made up of all nations and of all people. It's really a large number that no one can count, but God knows the number. And he says that they will indeed be victorious. That's the whole point. So you have this picture that people like to paint where you see the 144,000 there below and then this number and they say that's all but they're missing the point it's two different visions so really that needs to be two different things because the first one the 144,000 is like he was doing with physical Israel he's preparing them and then you see the picture of those who are victorious the ones who are trying like us to get to heaven we're going to be part of that number that in, uh, number that no one can measure and so it helps us understand that the main point is God is placing all of his people, those that are sealed, the redeemed under his protection and ownership, those are the genuine children of the Almighty. Now let me give you a couple more things and then we'll close. I want you to notice that once again, we're coming to the end of this section now, chapters 4 through 7, that is the seven seals. And it started out with this picture I think I might even have that. Well, I'll get to this in a second. Start out with this picture of heaven. And then we get into these seals, and it ends with a picture of heaven. And notice that in each case, you, what do you see? You see people 
glorifying God. Look in verse 15. If you want to know what heaven is going to be like, if you want to know the purpose, our purpose, God wants us to be with him in heaven, and you want to know what that's going to be like, look in verse 15. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple, and he who sits on the throne will dwell among them. That's what heaven's all about. It's about being in the presence of God. And then he goes on to describe it. No more hunger, no more pain, no more thirst, not even the sun. Instead, he's going to wipe away every tear. And just to emphasize that this is figurative language, notice who the shepherd's going to be. It says the lamb. Now, that's interesting. How many lambs, you know, are the shepherd of their own flock? <laughs> And yet, that's exactly how the church is set up, isn't it? Our shepherds are members of the flock. Yet, the Lamb, the Lamb of God, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, as he's also described, which is kind of an oxymoron whenever you think about it from a grammar point of view, is going to be the shepherd. What did Jesus say in John 10? I am the great shepherd. So here we see how the Bible is perfectly harmonious and that he is going to provide for us. We see this picture of heaven and everything else. All right, so what's the purpose of the vision? It's to help answer the question of why. When those martyrs are asking why. So he is giving them this vision to prepare them for what is about to come. That you may, as a Christian, you may die as a Christian. That suffering and death is a very real possibility for the Christian. But he wants you to know that God is in control. That's what this is all emphasizing. God's still in control no matter what. That gives me comfort because I get sometimes really aggravated and, and down about the world we live in. But I think, you know what? This world's not my home. I'm just passing through and here's some more pictures of it. It teaches that God is actively involved in everything that's happening, no matter if it's good or bad. He is always in control. And the enemies of the church are warned to repent and threatened with the punishment if they do not. God will have his vengeance. Doesn't he say that in Romans? Vengeance is mine. So that helps me to be able to live my life as a follower of Christ, to putting it in his hands. Sure helps whenever I want to forgive someone because say, hey, I'm going to forgive you because I wouldn't want to be in your shoes when you stand before the judgment of God. You see what he's doing there in that letter? So I hope today this will help you in understanding a little bit more. Now, you might have noticed that there's still that one seal. We haven't opened there, and we ran out of chapter 7. We're going into chapter 8, and if you're looking ahead, you kind of see. But there's a very, very important point that we need to talk about with that seventh seal. We'll save that for the next one because it's very important when it comes to interpreting the book of Revelation. So this evening... I hope this has helped you to understand more about uh, the book of Revelation, the book that God wants you to know. He had this reserved for you, and it's to give you that glimpse of what it is we're all here that most of us who have obeyed the gospel are here for because we want that hope of eternal life. We want to be in the presence of God. What about you? Do you want that as well? Well, we see before we get to the book of Revelation, those who wound up martyrs, those who are Christians, that number that is up there, the, the way they got there was through a process, a process of hearing the gospel, Romans 10, 17, of believing that Jesus is the Son of God, John 3, 16, repenting of their sins, uh, Luke 13, 3, and then confessing that Jesus is the Son of God, Matthew 10, 32, and then being baptized and added to the church, Acts 2, 38 and 47. So that's how people become a part of the number. That's how they get that seal we just talked about of the Holy Spirit, of God. Have you done that? Well, if not, why not? Tonight, we're going to give you the opportunity. We're going to sing this song of invitation. If you're subject to the gospel, I hope you'll avail yourself to it and come forward. Or if you have a need, a spiritual need to get your life right with God, please come as together we stand and sing.